We have one, please Adebayo, join me here, um, one remaining presentation here um, that will be by Professor Adebayo Lokusha, Impact on Political Governance in Africa. Professor Adebayo Lokusha is a NIE associate and former research program coordinator of the Nordic Africa Institute. He was executive secretary of CODESIA, director for Africa and West Asia at International IDEA, and is currently a researcher and distinguished professor at the WITS School of Governance from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. Adebayo, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Therese. My colleagues have said everything, <laughs> and there's almost nothing left uh, to, to add. Um, I would, I would like to latch on your closing uh, remarks on Ukraine uh, heading with regard to its own right to self-determination, to even make choices in the international system, uh, which ordinarily one would expect, as you said, would resonate with African countries, given our own history um, of where we are coming from. Uh, and what we often would assert in the international system as our right to self-determination, and so on and so forth. Um, I think part of the um, complexity of the times uh, is um, the initial loss, I would argue, of some of the natural sympathy that would have belonged to Ukraine by the fairly shabby treatment which African students experienced as people evacuated Ukraine um, with the hordes of people moving towards neighboring countries. Uh, images that dominated on the continent in countries that had the highest number of students in Ukraine. And there are many reasons why students went to Ukraine, mostly in the medical sciences um, caused a lot of horror. And for the first two weeks of invasion, um, dominant domestic conversation was how to evacuate our children. Uh, and, and you know, perhaps this was not sufficiently reported uh, outside of the continent, but it was a major shaper of perspectives. You see, this kind of open racism towards students who were not allowed to board trains, stopped by border guards, denied food rations, and you know, with a bit of social media exaggeration, I would admit, of course. Um, uh, basically, um, this was complemented in part by also some of the early commentaries that came from some of the so-called pundits on CNN, on BBC, on Radio France International, things which people listen to in Africa. And you hear your pundit saying, well, this is Europe. This is not supposed to happen in Europe. This is what happens in Africa. And people are saying, OK, excuse me. So we are the ones who should be experiencing all of this barbarism. It's, it belongs to us. It doesn't belong to Europe. Uh, and it took a lot of effort to retrace and correct that narrative, um, which I think in many respects was unfortunate because it also fed into the growing authoritarian impulse that we have seen on the continent um, for some time now, um, an impulse which some have summarized in terms of the uh, recession in democracy the global recession in democracy. Um, uh, and at the time the war started, uh, I would imagine, uh, certainly for me, that the immediate response from a democracy point of view was, oh my God, what kind of timing could this be that basically enables authoritarian regimes to derive comfort and those that were hesitant about whether to jump ship or stay the course to effectively make the move to the other side. Um, 
And I will argue that one of the immediate consequences, therefore, on governance on the continent has been to create a void in the international system uh, on account of the geopolitics that you have all described, colleagues, uh, of the war, in a manner that effectively strengthened the forces of democratic recession and regression uh, on the continent. Um, and this is not just limited to those regimes that were already problematic. Uh, and there were already problematic regimes. For those, if we did a typology of African countries at the time of the war, you had those countries that were already sanctioned, either by the West or by their fellow African uh, countries, for one reason or the other. This was a perfect opportunity to have good company, so to speak, in Russia, and to be able to reach out to break some of the sanctions, whether it be from Mali or indeed even from Equatorial Guinea or any of the other already sanctioned countries like Zimbabwe. Uh, this was like um, a window of opportunity uh, for them. Uh, and I would in fact pay much more attention from this point of view to the regime type uh, that is in place in different African countries more than any other uh, factor um, uh, in so far as uh, the interests of regime survival uh, also seemed to me uh, to be preeminent and predominant in the choices that were made, including also even by the hybrid regimes that were not necessarily fully autocratic but could not certainly be passed as necessarily democratic. Then a republic, uh, for example. But for all of them, without exception, going to the issue of food security, there was an awareness that much as this situation, this shift in the global geopolitics um, provided some relief from pressures that they would otherwise experience uh, from the West on their governance processes. Um, that the rising prices of food probably constituted the most immediate possible threat to their survival. And we know uh, from history, bread and power in Africa are very closely connected. And uh, if you recall the um, coups of the 1970s uh, into the 80s, uh, the fall of Numeri in Sudan, the almost uh, first serious attempt to overthrow Mubarak in Egypt was all related to the price of bread going up. Slight increases in comparison to the kinds of increases that we see today. And for many of the regimes, therefore, from that point of view, um, the response was to say African Union. Actually, there was a common position uh, from Africa in that regard. African Union, you need to do something. And so the chair of the African Union and the uh, president of Senegal uh, undertook that trip to uh, Kiev and Moscow to make an appeal uh, to uh, uh, um, Zelensky and Putin uh, to do something quick about the food situation in order to avoid further instability uh, on the continent. I think also at the third level, um, in the context of severe and growing insecurity on the continent, insecurity mostly underwritten by radical extremist groups, um, the move by several of those affected countries to embrace Russia more than the West was further made easier for them in a context in which Russia itself was now in need of allies, as many allies as it would be able to count uh, on its side. And no better mechanism or means by which to secure regime loyalty, again, I'm really emphasizing regime survival more than national interest, um, to secure regime loyalty was essentially through the supply of the weaponry which would be needed, not even the introduction of Wagner necessarily, but the supply of the weaponry that would be needed 
to fight the insecurity that was threatening uh, the survival of some of the governments. And here again, I think it's important to note that the um, narrative for a long time was focused on China and its unconditional aid, right? Uh, unlike the West and its conditional aid. Um, you are fighting Boko Haram, as President Buhari said once, and now the United States is coming to lecture us on human rights. These are radical extremists whom we want to eliminate. But we are told to respect their rights when they don't respect our rights and the rights of worshippers whom they bomb in mosques, in mosques and churches. And then you get a supply of weapons on fast track by Russia. Uh, it makes your life uh, and your choices, I think, a bit more um, uh, more interesting. Uh, and that ability to be able to say we have choice um, that enlarges the notion that was used in Zimbabwe of looking east beyond China to include Russia. And of course, in all of these historical arguments are mobilized, as you indicated, uh, Henning, uh, to try to justify some of the choices made. What seems, however, and you know, one can discount those arguments. You know, they support the liberation. The, you know, um, uh, one can discount those arguments. But I think for me, what is also remarkable um, is that there hasn't been a groundswell of opinion and action on the ground in most countries on Ukraine. Right? Whether regimes, governments voted for or voted against any resolution, was look at the general state of public opinion, barring a few efforts to do some solidarity collection, which is still really, I would say, a very miserable minority effort, um, insofar as I've been able to track it. Um, we haven't seen opinion makers and others. And it is precisely, I think, because of a feeling not so much of indifference, uh, but perhaps much more of questioning. Why would Russia be isolated and punished in this way when others in recent history got away with more of the same thing? Right? So not necessarily saying we condone what Russia did, but you read editorials that say, well, Maybe it's better to negotiate. Well, maybe it's better for Mr. Zelensky to also tone down, because after all, you are dealing with the superpower, um, and so on and so forth. Opinion pieces that shape public perception, uh, but which basically reflect a dilemma uh, about how you know, popular response uh, to, the, the, to, to the crisis um, uh, is basically formed in most of the countries. Uh, and if, as I live in South Africa, you'll find that most of the um, expression of concern uh, actually sometimes take a very racial line, which weakens also the effect of such concerns on an ANC-led government in South Africa, which we just say, well, it's a minor. The usual people uh, criticizing our foreign policy. And I think for me, from the governance point of view, what it also means is that in this anodyne state um, of, of popular response to um, what would ordinarily uh, be seen as a major assault on principles and values which Africans could and should be defending, um, that we actually are also creating the conditions for a further reinforcement of the authoritarian impulses that are already underway in demobilizing itself on certain questions civil society and civic forces are also unable to mobilize counter arguments and counter forces against the declining uh, practice uh, and respect for the principles of democratic governance, uh, as we have seen. Um, and regime after regime have taken an opportunity where they can effectively to tighten the uh, political system. 
first in anticipation of a breakdown of order on account of rising food prices. So rules about no assembly, you can't demonstrate without author authorization, regardless of what the constitution says. Secondly, from regime insecurity itself, um, in an age of, of coups and of citizen disquiet about democracy not delivering sufficiently uh, and wondering whether we might not in fact be better of getting a stronger leadership a stronger leadership which may not necessarily be represented by a strong man Putin, but which sometimes finds itself in people, maybe semi-informed admiration of uh, Putin's uh, ability to maneuver uh, and the skills which he seems to have displayed uh, in managing uh, the um, situation, particularly with regard to sanctions. So effectively, that nostalgia which was rejected once as part of um, a movement of democratization that said no more room for strongman politics in Africa is effectively finding its way back into discourses about whether actually our solution is in getting new generation of strongmen. Um, and leaders who have uh, tended to show themselves to be more open and conciliatory to public opinion and to conversation and negotiation have basically, I think, seen um, public opinion treating them as essentially very weak leaders. Um, um, again, I can cite the example of, uh, of South Africa where I am at the present time, where the crime of uh, the president uh, primarily is that he's too weak. Um, at a time when the world is dangerous and we need strong people. Uh, and on the other hand, um, people who are celebrated uh, as uh, effective and able to manage and control things, uh, even if it is only in terms of appearance, uh, are not too far away and are seen as the heroes of the continent uh, today. And I think it is in these shifts, not only in the geopolitics, of the world uh, and what kinds of implications it means for a continent that is as sensitive to global food chains as it is to global political chains and to global ideational chains. It is precisely in that shift that we actually begin to see the dangers uh, to the future of democratic governance on the continent. <coughs> and the one way in which perhaps this war provides an opportunity for a rethink on the continent uh, is at one level um, uh, an invitation, I guess, to all of us uh, to also begin to rethink the global multilateral system uh, in terms of the way in which it works uh, with a view, hopefully, to forging a new um, order that will be more inclusive uh, and which will have mechanisms as was actually envisaged under the doctrine of collective security, that will um, put in place mechanisms that will sanction infractions uh, of the collective will of the international community by any and all violators of those. Of those. Uh, and from the African point of view, I think this will itself creates the kinds of domestic environment which we require in order also to begin to renegotiate the social contract between state and society. Thank you.